I took a trip to Pottery Barn recently, which inspired me to create a few dupes, so that's what we're doing today. First up, I came across these pillar candle holders while scrolling the site. It says they were new about a month ago, but I don't see them on the site anymore. Anyways, as I was looking at them, I was thinking I could easily recreate this shape using a styrofoam cone and a circle, which I already have in my stash. At first, I just glued the cone right down on the circle. However, I realized I wanted to cut the top of the cone off a little bit so there was more surface for that circle to sit on top. Now, I know some of you don't like when I share my mistakes or what I would do different. All I'll say is this is a DIY channel and DIY is not perfect. I will continue to share my trial and error process and being transparent in my videos to help those who do appreciate it from making the same mistakes as I have. Back to the DIY, since the Pottery Barn version is ceramic, I wanted to figure out how I could get the styrofoam to look smoother than it is. I had two different ideas to do this and used both since I'm creating two candle holders to see if one turns out better. On the taller one, I'm gonna use Plaster of Paris. I mixed up the powder and water using a two to one ratio until it was smooth. You only have a few minutes to work with this stuff, so I had to work pretty quickly. I thought I could get a smooth look by pouring it over the cone. This worked out pretty well. It is not perfectly smooth, but I was able to sand it down once it was dry. The second method I tried was joint compound. I didn't want to completely cover the cone with joint compound, but I added way too much at first. So I took my spatula and just kind of spread it over the surface to fill in all of those holes and removed all of the excess. Like I said, the plaster didn't turn out perfectly smooth, but it wasn't too bad. I sanded down both the plaster cone and the joint compound cone to get them smoother. Although you could also get a smooth surface by covering the cones with poster board and save yourself all of this time and effort. Next, I painted all of the pieces with white paint. All right, now we can attach the circles back to the cones. I measured the sides this time to make sure I glue the cone down right in the center. Since this is a pillar candle holder, you want to make sure it's centered so the circle doesn't break off under the weight. Once I found the center, I marked it with a Sharpie and then I used my Starbond super glue to attach the pieces together. This gives them a really secure hold. Now to add the design, the Pottery Barn piece looked like watercolor and I bought these watercolors from the Dollar Tree a while back. The blue in this kit wasn't the right shade that I was looking for, so I'm using another blue I had and mixed the black watercolor to get a deep blue. You wanna add a lot of water to this paint to get that wash of color and not so saturated. Pro tip, if you need to add a straight line onto something, figure out how high you want that line to be. I'm using a paint container and put your project on a turntable. Then you can hold your hand and the brush stationary and spin the object to get a perfect straight line. Then I added in the decorative pattern along the bottom. I like to use a pointed paintbrush here to get that variation in the lines a little bit easier. I'm not the best painter at things like this, but I just kept referencing the Pottery Barn version and did my best. Again, just make sure you have a lot of water in the paint, unless you want that more saturated look. I really like the uneven color. You could leave the candle holders just like this. They look beautiful, but the Pottery Barn version also had some paint splatter on them, which I wanted to add to mine as well. I wanted to make the blue darker for this part, so I added in even more black, but it doesn't look super different in the end. I wish it was a little bit darker, but I added even more water into the mix and I used my finger to flick the watercolor onto the pieces. The additional water really helps it to flow off the brush nicely. Lastly for this project, I wanted to get that high gloss finish, so I sprayed it with a satin sealer first. I didn't have a gloss spray sealer and didn't want the watercolor to smear if I had used a brush. But then I went back over top with a gloss Mod Podge.
this project is super easy. I saw these glass bead garlands on the Pottery Barn website and loved the update to the wood bead garland that's been around for a few years. I bought this large pack of mini clear ornaments at Hobby Lobby around Christmas time and had half of the container left that I didn't use. These are perfect to get that same look, but you could also use ping pong balls, which was my original idea. I just didn't have any on hand. I removed the top hanger from the ornaments and then since they're plastic, I was able to use my hot knife and remove the top of the ornament. You could also just use an X-Acto knife to do this. What I love about these ornaments is that they all have a different pattern to them, but they're still clear. Originally, I wanted to do the sea glass look, but realized I didn't have any sea glass spray paint and that stuff is pretty expensive. So this version added texture and intrigue just through the patterns. Once I had all of the tops off, I also needed to add a hole to the opposite side to feed a string through it and make that garland. I wanted to use a spade bit, but couldn't find my smallest one, so I tried out a drill bit and that worked great. Now to string them up, I'm using twine, which is what the Pottery Barn versions looked like they used as well. I taped off the end of the twine to feed it through the holes easier, and then it cut off a strand long enough to go through all of my ornaments. I had to add a little extra to account for the knots I needed to add in as well. I don't love how frayed jute twine looks, so I took my lighter to singe off all those messy bits. You do not need to do this step. It can be a little scary when the flame travels up the twine so close to your hand, so please use caution if you do this. Now all you need to do is tie a knot at the end and start stringing the ornaments on. For the end knot, I had to tie three times so the large hole doesn't slip right over it. And then I tied double knots for everyone after that. I strung on an ornament, tied a knot right up against that hole so there wasn't any slack, and then strung on the next ornament. I added 11 ornaments onto this garland because I don't like even numbers on things like this, but like I said, such an easy DIY project, and I created this one for free where Pottery Barn is charging between $50 and $100 for theirs. You could get two packs of ping pong balls from the Dollar Tree and spend $2.50 to make your own version. Next up, I found these textured candles and diffuser set, and we all know I love textures. Now I'm not gonna make this whole set, I'm just taking inspiration from it. At first I had the idea to wrap clay around a vase and then carve into the clay, but clay shrinks as it dries. That would have caused a lot of cracking. So instead I decided to create the whole thing solely out of clay. I bought this 10 pound box of clay last summer and still had plenty left to work with. I rolled a chunk out into a slab and used these decorative molding pieces that I had to keep the clay the same width. Then I cut out six pieces, two five by five inch squares and four one and a half by five inch rectangles. I built my bud vase, adding two of the rectangle sides onto the square front. When you connect pieces of clay together, you wanna score and slip it so they have a strong bond and don't crack apart as they dry. So I scored the edge of both pieces being connected and added some slip, which is clay mixed with water. This acts as a glue. I realized my slip is a different color. I had grabbed the wrong one by accident, but that's okay, you don't even see it in the end. Then when you have this side together, you also need to blend out the seam where they meet. 
So I was taking a clay tool and pushing the clay up and down between the two pieces until there was no seam and the, one si and the side was smooth. I did the same process to apply the second square side, but because the clay is super wet and moldable at this point, I needed to put something inside to hold it up. This two by four wood piece was almost the perfect depth, so I used this. I know I'm kind of flying through this part, but that's because I'm no expert when it comes to creating ceramics or clay vessels, and I don't think you guys are interested in an in-depth tutorial here. I let the clay dry for a bit until it would stand on its own and not collapse. And then I removed the block and added an opening for the neck of the bud vase. All right, now that this is built, I let it dry for several days. It was probably a week before I came back to it. Next, I painted the whole thing black and gave it two coats. I'm using DIY paint and black velvet here, but you could use any color and any brand, that part doesn't matter. The only thing I would keep in mind here is we're going to scratch the surface to reveal the clay underneath. This is a terracotta clay, so I made sure I would like the two colors together. It didn't take long at all for the paint to dry against the clay. Then I got out some more of my clay tools to start carving the paint away and revealing that clay underneath. I went back and forth using a few different clay tools to do this. I didn't want a super uniform and perfect look and the different tools gave slightly different results. The one tool would take a larger chunk out of the clay and combine two of my lines that I was adding and I actually liked how that looked and wanted it to be sporadic all over the piece. I etched the bud vase around the front and the two sides. Ideally, I would do the back as well, but this took such a long time to do it and my hand was really cramping up, so I ignored the back today. But I really love how this piece turned out, even more so that I created the whole thing from scratch. For this project, I thought these circle sculptures would be easy to make and look modern as a shelf sitter. I'm going to share a few things I would have done different as we get into it, but I started out with these wreath rings from the Dollar Tree and some string to measure the circumference of the ring. I knew I wanted to use aluminum foil as a form and then cover it. I ripped off a piece of the foil that was the same length as my string and then started folding it in half and then in half again and again and so on until it was pretty small. Then I squished it with my hands so it wasn't a flat rectangle and gave it a thicker shape. I should have either wrapped the foil around the wreath rings or gotten out some wire to put in the middle of the foil to shape it, but I didn't do that. The wire would have given it much more stability. Next, I joined the two circles together at the bottom and twisted the foil around each other. Then I took some strips of brown shipping paper and some watered down glue to add a layer of paper mache around the foil. This is gonna help smooth out some of those lumps in the foil and make it a little bit more uniform. I had to let this dry out overnight before moving on to the next step. Here's the next thing I would have done different. So now I glued my circles onto a block for the base. And while this seems like a good idea to glue it together at this stage, it really didn't work out. If I'd had that additional wire inside of the foil, I think it would have been okay, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Next, I mixed up some of my instant paper mache, and this is what I'm gonna use to cover the entire sculpture piece. Then I started to fill in any gaps on the base and where the circles meet with the paper mache. Again, I thought this was a great idea to help hold it all together and give it stability. Then I worked my way around the circles, adding the paper mache to cover the whole thing. Since this is wet, it started to get heavy and pull the circles down. The small one was okay, it was when I started adding the paper mache onto the bigger circle. 
That's when it started to sink and pull down the whole thing. I was gonna give up feeling like I couldn't save it, but off camera, I decided to cut the circles apart and let them dry. Then I added a second layer of the paper mache to fill in any obvious divot areas and to smooth it out a little bit more. Now I can put it all together the same way as I did, did at the beginning. I glued the circle to the base and then covered it all with paper mache to hold it together. paper mache dried, I sanded the sculpture just to smooth out any of the rough edges. It's still not going to be completely smooth, but the Pottery Barn version also has lumps and bumps along it, so I think this looks pretty close. You can see how sanding it just knocks off all those loose paper pieces and cleans it up. Then I spray painted it in the color Heirloom White. I think this would also look great and even more modern in black. This project is oddly hard, but easy. I recently found these large dowels at the Dollar Tree and I've had this wood circle in my stash also from the Dollar Tree. The dowels come in a pack of two and we need three for this project, although you could use four if you wanted. I was inspired by this modern plant stand and this one has four legs. I just wanted to make mine with three, but my version is also much smaller. I have this little white Ikea planter pot that fits perfectly on the circle, so I then found out how tall I wanted the dowel to be against the planter. It was difficult to figure out how to get the legs on. I knew I wanted to use wood glue so the bond would be strong, but it was not easy attaching a dowel to the edge of a circle. I fumbled around with it for quite a while and then got a clamp out to hold it in place. I had to let each leg dry in place before adding on the next. So when it was time to add the next leg on, I measured the circumference of the circle so I knew where to put the next two and they would be evenly spaced. Then I got out my mini level to make sure the plant stand is functional and I don't glue one of the legs on slightly higher than another. I also had the genius idea to add a dab of hot glue to hold it in place while I got the clamp on. Now, why didn't I think of that sooner? Who knows, better late than never though, right? I did the same thing for the third leg, which was the easiest one to put on. Then once the last leg was dried, I'm painting the whole thing with my bronze patina paint by Dixie Belle. I don't plan on adding the patina spray here to distress or age this piece. I just wanted that metal look that was similar to the Pottery Barn version.
Now, when I saw this little ceramic basket on the Pottery Barn site, I immediately thought I could make that with Jenga blocks. It took me a little while to figure it out, but eventually I had the idea. I laid out my blocks in this formation to create a circle. The challenging part was that only the very corner of the horizontally placed blocks were touching the vertical blocks. But I figured I could hot glue them like this and then fill in the gaps. So I went around the circle, hot gluing all of the corners together. Then I need to start adding on the next layer. It looks like as the basket went up on the Pottery Barn version, it tapered in. So again, I added the vertical Jenga blocks on at an angle. Next, I added another row of the blocks horizontally in between the straight up and down sections. At this point, the full block still fits perfectly in the middle. And again, I only glued the corners at an angle. I decided to only make mine three rows high, but I didn't need to add another block to make it taller. I just need to add a block across to finish off that top. However, since the block is tapered in now, the full Jenga block doesn't fit in between. So I got out my miter box to cut a small bit of the block off until it fits. I think it looks pretty good just like this. If you're not a perfectionist like I am, you can paint it up and throw some flowers in it to be done. But as usual, I'm gonna take it a step further and fill in all of those gaps. I chose this joint compound to fill in the gaps, but I think wood filler might have been a better choice. Anyways, I filled in all of the gaps and I had to do this a few times because the joint compound shrinks a little bit as it dries. I also wish I would have filled in the gaps a little bit more with the hot glue to make the gaps sturdier before adding in the joint compound. But once all of the gaps were filled in, I took a 220 grit sandpaper and smoothed it out. I didn't worry about getting all the joint compound sanded off because I'm gonna be painting this piece and the paint will even it out. Next, I painted the whole thing white with Fluff by Dixie Belle. You can use any color or brand of paint for this, but I only gave it one thick coat. Now to get that high gloss finish, I ended up picking up some gloss spray sealer and covered the vase with this. I didn't wanna see brush strokes from painting on the gloss Mod Podge like I did with the pillar candle holders, but other than the size of this little vase, I think it looks pretty darn close to the Pottery Barn version. this planter, how it looks like a basket and that two-tone color of it, it fits right into my aesthetic and is so easy to recreate. I bet you're thinking I would use the brown nautical rope or thick jute twine, but no. I remember I had these tan mesh tube ribbons from the Dollar Tree and I like the look of this much better. I am using the white nautical rope and you can certainly use jute twine or the brown nautical rope if you decide to recreate this for yourself. For the nautical rope, I untwisted so I have three individual strands. This is gonna give it less of a coastal look and a little more boho or contemporary look. It also helps the cohesion with the mesh tube. I 
had this plastic planner in my stash and it was the size I wanted, of course, the larger size base you use, the more rope you're going to need. I thought this was gonna end up using a lot more rope than it did, but I'm starting out with the mesh tubing on the bottom of the planter and I'm using hot glue to attach it. I don't think a stronger adhesive is necessary here unless you will be putting this outside in the heat, then you might risk that hot glue melting. So like I said, I thought I would use a lot more rope than I did and I was worried I would run out of the mesh tubing. I had four new packages and one open that I used half of on another project. So as I was gluing it down, I pulled on the mesh a little bit to flatten out the tube. This made it stretch and go a little bit further. When I got to the end of each strand of the mesh tube, it was really easy to attach the next one. They blended right into each other seamlessly and you can't even tell. That's not exactly the case for the nautical rope. I went a little less than halfway up the planner with the mesh tube before switching over to the white rope. Now the white rope is made up of a ton of individual strings, so you can't just glue down the bottom and leave it. You need to glue all of those strings together so nothing unravels in the back. I also made sure to start and end each section in the same spot so this can be the back. When I got to the top, I'm adding in some handles like the Pottery Barn version had. I just let the rope droop and then glued it again a few inches over. I did a handle on each side of the basket and then I went around them twice. So it wasn't just one strand of the rope and had a little bit more substance to it. I glued the two strands of the handles together. Then to finish off the rope, I glued one row on the inside and then ended the rope kind of under the lip of the basket. This was a super easy project. I then took out one of my plants that fit inside of the basket and put it out on display. I've been wanting to make another concrete project and these garden spheres seem like the perfect choice. I thought they would be relatively easy to make and I'd be able to put them out in my front garden. If you bought all three sizes from Pottery Barn, you're spending over $300. Now again, they are pretty large compared to the ones I'm going to make, but the overall look is the same. And I don't know about you, but I would never pay $200 for a concrete ball. I picked up three different size sport balls from the Dollar Tree. The two smaller ones are foam and the soccer ball was in the Dollar Tree Plus section, so I spent $7.50 here. Then I took 80 grit sandpaper to rough up the edges. I haven't worked with cement a lot and I wasn't sure if this would stick to a shiny surface, so I scuffed up the surface of all three balls. Now for this cement, I had this quick setting cement from Quickcrete that I bought for a project a few years ago. I scooped out some of the powder into a plastic Dollar Tree bowl. I didn't want to ruin a nice bowl and then I added some water to mix it up. I don't have exact measurements or ratios here. I just added water until I was happy with the consistency. I made it a little more runny so it was easier to spread over the balls. This cement also starts to set quickly since that's the type I had, but you can also get cement that has a longer working time. At first I thought I would be able to just roll the ball in the cement and it would get covered. Well, that really didn't work as you can see. It only added a super thin and uneven dusting. 
So then I would use my silicone spoon to start scooping the cement over the top. I added a glob of the cement and then spread it and smoothed it out with my gloved hand. This was working out so well, it was looking great and smooth, and then I had to get to the bottom half of the sphere. I flip it over in my hands and start adding the cement to the bottom. Again, it's great, smoothing out beautifully, until I go to set it down and remove my hands from it. The cement was just sticking to the gloves now. Every spot I would touch just took a chunk of the cement right off of the ball. I didn't know what to do and the cement was getting thicker. So I thought, well, if I just add a really thin coat for the first layer, I can come back and add a second thicker layer once it dries and it should stick better to the surface. So I set this one aside to dry. Make sure you lay out some wax paper or something nonstick to protect your work surface and to place the balls on to dry. I did the same thing with the other two balls, just spread a thin layer over the surface and set them aside to dry. Once they were dried, I took a 100 grit sandpaper to smooth them out before adding the next coat. I think the 100 grit paper was a little bit too rough. It was taking off too much of that cement right down to the ball surface. I also don't know that it's necessary since we're adding in that second layer. The soccer ball was working much better from the beginning and I think that's because this is a hard ball where the other two were squishy foam balls. All right, for the next coat, I decided not to wear my gloves I know, I know, don't come for me. I should be wearing gloves, but my hands are just so tiny that no gloves fit me properly. And since the cement was just sticking to them, I didn't wanna deal with that. But I made this mixture a little bit more on the runny side and scooped it out onto the ball, just like I did the first time. It was just so much easier to use my hands for this and cement wasn't being pulled off of the ball. This time, once I covered the first half of the ball, I set it down on my wax paper to do the second side. This way I didn't need to keep touching where I had already smoothed it out. I could add the rest of the cement and just leave it right on the table in place to dry. Once the second layer of the cement was dry, I went back in with a 220 grit sandpaper this time. This was working so well and smoothed out the surface. I wasn't looking for a super smooth look here, so I was happy with how it turned out. I did originally have the idea to pour my cement into a balloon. I've desperately been wanting to try that technique, but I didn't think they would turn out round enough for this project. Next, I'm spray painting the spheres with my heirloom white spray paint. I had to do a few coats to get a fuller coverage. I thought I was gonna stop here and leave them, but my spray paint had a satin finish and I didn't love that with a cement ball. I remembered I have a giant bag of lime from my kitchen makeover and thought that would be perfect. I wish I had thought of this before the spray paint. I think it would have given a nice organic look to the cement. But I mixed some water in with the lime and brushed it onto the balls with a chippy brush. The lime gives a flat matte finish, which, which looks so much better. I didn't wanna see brush strokes on the balls. It's hard to see them on the camera, but while the line was still a little bit wet, I rubbed my hands over the balls to smooth out any of those brush stroke lines. This was looking so good now. The Pottery Barn versions had some areas of color variation, and I wanted to do that on mine as well, but I didn't wanna use paint or dry brush, so I got out my natural pigments, but cinnamon or spices would also work just as well, and I dipped my fingers into the powder and rubbed them across the balls. I also took the chippy brush with lime wash still on it, dipped in the powder and dry brushed that back and forth. This is a very subtle accent, but I didn't wanna to go too far and I love how they turned out.
finally starting to give my deck a little facelift after two years of chipping stain, and I wanted to make some sort of privacy screen since my neighbors are so close. I love the look of this one from Pottery Barn, but we are not spending over $700 for it. So I headed to Home Depot to find some wood that could work. These one by twos look like the exact same size as the Pottery Barn version, so I picked up 20 of them. We also need some two by twos for the vertical supports, so I got two of these. Total cost for the wood was just under $60, I'll take it. Instead of staining the wood the mid-tone brown like the Pottery Barn, I decided to go with the same color I was going to stain my deck. This decadent chocolate brown by Bear called Tugboat is going to look so good against my house. At this point, I hadn't landed on all of my furniture elements for this space, and I didn't want to have multiple wood tones competing with each other. I have never used this deck over product before and was completely thrown off by how thick it is. At first I had tried to apply it just like a stain, but it would have taken me forever. So I got out a little roller, but that wasn't really working either. It was laying the stain down so splotchy that I ended up getting out a good old fashioned paintbrush to apply the stain. For some reason I forgot to record it, but I painted the 2 by 2s in the color Black Magic by Bear. I also cut down two scrap pieces of wood from my garage of a 1 by 4 to 15 inches each. These are going to be the base of the privacy screen. And of course Sarge has to be my helper until I started using the nail gun and he got scared. Building this thing was super easy, but it took me way longer than it should have. I built this over Memorial Day weekend and it was so hot. I had to keep going back inside to cool off. I realized as soon as I laid down the first one by two that they were a bit too long for what I wanted. So I took the boards back into my garage and cut a foot off to make them seven feet instead of eight. To make the cutting go a little bit quicker, I cut down three boards at a time and then back out to the deck we go. I'm making the one by two boards hang over the two by two by one foot on both sides. So I measured where that is and then added some wood glue and nailed it in place. For the top board, I made sure it was flush with the top of the 2x2 two two as well and repeated this on the opposite side. For the spacing in between each slat, I used a 1x2 so all of the boards would be evenly spaced down the whole thing. Here's how it's looking so far. Some of the boards are not perfectly straight, but I picked out the best ones I could find. I don't think it looks too bad. But when you're using a nail gun, please pay close attention to where your fingers are. A few times the nail hit a knot in the wood and the nail shot out sideways. This guy caught me right in my finger and there was blood everywhere. I didn't get that moment on camera, but it hurt pretty good. Now, remember I showed you these two black one x four boards for the feet? 
Well, I screwed these on, but they were not heavy enough to hold up and support the weight of this privacy screen. So I looked through my garage and found some leftover butcher block, also from my kitchen makeover, and that stuff is solid. So I removed these feet and decided to add pocket holes for an even better hold, considering this thing isn't light. I put a pocket hole on both sides of the two by two. And then I had to wait for my son to get home to help me hold this thing straight while I screwed it in place. I added some more wood glue to the bottom of the two by two for a little extra security. I didn't get a chance to paint the new feet for this video, but like I said, I'm working on the deck and, I, and I'll have that video coming soon. I know makeovers aren't my most watched videos, but I still like to share them with you guys. Anyways, once I got the screen in place, I felt like the space between the slats is a little bit too big. In looking back at the Pottery Barn version, the spacing looks exactly the same, but I think I might try to add something a little more to it. Stay tuned for the deck makeover to see what that is. I also may be overthinking it because this is the first thing I've done for this space while the rest of the deck is still looking pretty rough. <laughs> 